Okay, good evening everyone. It's good to see some familiar faces and, and welcome um, all. Um, my name is Summer Ali and I have the pleasure of introducing um, Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer this evening. Um, a first generation college graduate, Daniel Deermeyer is the ninth chancellor at Vanderbilt University. Chancellor Deermeyer is University Distinguished Professor in the Owen Graduate School of Management and Distinguished University Professor of Political Science in the College of Arts and Science. He is a fellow of the, Academic, of the American Academy of Arts and Science and the Guggenheim Foundation. Most recently, earlier this year, he was named one of Carnegie Corporation's um, Great Immigrants, Great Americans, an annual list honoring naturalized citizens' contributions to democracy and to America. He has published five books and more than 100 research articles in academic journals in the fields of political science, economics and management, linguistics, sociology, psychology, computer science, operations research, and applied mathematics. Not at all intimidating. And to editorialize for a moment, in essence, he's what we call a polymath. Throughout his career, Chancellor Deermeyer has proven to be a bold innovator, combining excellence as a leader, researcher, and teacher with an experimental and entrepreneurial mindset. And it is with this mindset that he has launched Dialogue Vanderbilt and Free Speech Week at Vanderbilt, which contributes to his and his team's commitment to creating a culture of radical collaboration and personal growth for Vanderbilt's faculty, students, and staff, and particularly to expand Vanderbilt's global presence. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Chancellor Deermeyer to the stage. Glad we got that in at the end. So, well, thank you very much and welcome everyone. Welcome to Dialogue Vanderbilt Free Speech Week in light of the very difficult and painful events that have occurred over the last week and continue to unfold in Israel and Gaza. I'm particularly grateful that on our campus, we can come together for difficult conversations in the spirit of open inquiry and mutual respect. We are proud to host tonight's conversation with Brett Stevens and Samar Ali, and to welcome all of you in the conversation. Free speech is a bedrock principle at Vanderbilt. It is indispensable for a university's work and is especially essential to Vanderbilt's purpose of providing a transformative education and path-breaking research. Our practice of bringing together people of differing viewpoints to accelerate progress dates actually back to our founding 150 years ago. Do we have a, do we have a sesquicentennial sign here? Always. <laughs> Always. That's good. There it is, okay? 150 years ago, when a northern industrialist and a southern minister joined forces, to create a university that could help move society forward from the devastation and divisions of the Civil War. It was really the idea that it was a university that could heal a divided nation. These values and these goals have really animated us since, and we particularly trace this event today back to another event very important that happened in the 1960s when our impact symposia hosted speakers as diverse and as divisive at the time as Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, Storm Thurmond, and Allen Ginsberg. It was during that polarized era that Vanderbilt's fifth chancellor, Alexander Hurt, explained our commitment to free speech and open discourse. He said, and I quote, a university's obligation is not to protect students from ideas, but rather to expose them to ideas and to help make them capable of handling and hopefully having ideas of their own. More than five decades later, we live by this principle, and it is why we created Dialogue Vanderbilt. Through Dialogue Vanderbilt, we're teaching our first-year students and other members of our university community 
how to engage in constructive conversation, even and especially when they disagree. In today's era of drastic polarization, our university community is learning anew how to debate and disagree without falling into the trap of moral condemnation and rushing to righteousness. We are learning to listen, to stay open to the forceless force of the better argument, as philosopher Jürgen Habermas has put it, and more importantly, we are learning, even if we don't change our point of view because it forces us to have better arguments and better foundation for that very point of view. We see again and again that protecting free speech on campus is not an abstract concern. Over the past year, over the past week, with emotions running high in the wake of Hamas atrocities in Israel, campus communities across the country were ripped apart in a contest of who could scream loudest. I'm proud of our One Vanderbilt community for handling these wretching events differently. Students with different perspectives and different points of view organized events to make their views known. And while the debates on our campus might be and might have been passionate, in the end, we treat each other with decency and with respect, never losing sight of our common goals and our common purpose or our shared humanity. As shouting matches replace thoughtful debate everywhere from the, from the halls of Congress to school board meetings, and as more of us retreat into our own ideological bubbles filled with the luxury of curated news, a college campus might be the last best place where we can learn to converse, cooperate, discuss, and coexist. This is crucial for students learning to navigate civic life and for the future of democratic, pluralistic government. We in government, we in higher education must get this right. Tonight's conversation is civil discourse and action, and we have two worthy experts to lead us. If you read Brett Stevens' name, you know he's one of our most thoughtful and articulate champions of free speech on university campuses today. I met Brett a while ago at a conference and have long admired his fierce advocacy for free speech and the power of reason. His coverage of foreign affairs at the Jerusalem Post and for many years at the Wall Street Journal and now from his vantage point as a columnist at the New York Times give him a particularly deep understanding of why free speech is indispensable for universities, for nations, and for every one of us as individuals. Professor Sam Ali helps lead the Vanderbilt Project on Unity and American Democracy. She brings a perspective that combines a wide range of experience, including research and conflict resolution, law, and also her experience and positions in the Obama White House and the administration of former Governor Bill Haslam. As the founder of the nonprofit Millions of Conversations, in her work with the Unity Project, Summer has worked tirelessly in this moment of deep polarization to preserve civil discourse and foster dialogue among Americans with different opinions and beliefs. She will also, importantly, publish a book with Penguin Random House in 2025 on realizing peace to democracy and belonging. Brad and Summer are about to give us a masterclass, we hope, in the kind of thoughtful, passionate, and civil exchange of ideas that leads to greater understanding, greater unity, and real solutions. I thank them and all of you for being here tonight. Thank you. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Brett, for joining us and coming to Nashville for the first time and to Vanderbilt for the first time at um, such an important moment in our city, in our state, in our country, and the world. And we are very glad that you are here. 
And I think that um, many, let me just say this, many of you are probably surprised to be sitting, uh, seeing Brett Stevens and myself sitting here to model um, civil discourse um, for a whole host of reasons, which I've heard people making assumptions about both of our opinions. And what I think I would just start off with saying is that we're complex. And I think we're going to be having, and you're going to be seeing that in this conversation this evening, a complex conversation for a complex time. So with that, given that this is Free Speech Week and Dialogue Vanderbilt, I'm going to start with a series of questions about free speech. And the first question is, um, you know, how do you define free speech um, from your perspective? What is protected speech in America today? And what is unprotected speech? Uh, well, first of all, what an honor and pleasure uh, it is to be here. Um, second of all, um, not to contradict your chancellor, but there's a German expression, uh, don't praise the day until the evening. So we'll see how we do. Uh, um, look, something like that. Um, uh, free speech is unfettered speech minus uh, well-defined areas where uh, the Supreme Court has placed uh, uh, precise limitations on it when it comes to libel, slander, uh, imminent, uh, imminent danger. You can look to uh, Supreme Court cases, you know, to, to to find where you draw distinctions. Um, I tend to think it is not helpful to think of free speech as uh, a legal concept, a kind of inheritance, like it or not, from uh, the First Amendment. I think of free speech as uh, the great enabler of intellectual challenge, intellectual thought, and ultimately uh, progress. Um, I, I've, I've written this before, but, but I feel it very uh, strongly. If you cannot speak freely, you will not be able to think clearly. And it's why universities, particularly private universities that can impose legally speaking, limitations on permissible speech should not be the ones to do it because the goal of a great university like Vanderbilt ultimately is intellectual excellence. And you cannot achieve that kind of excellence unless you are allowing people to put forward ideas, some of which are undoubtedly gonna be stupid, some of which are undoubtedly going to be hurtful. But just in the way that in, in science, it proceeds through trial and error, I think that's true in the humanities and, and every field of academia uh, too. In order to think more clearly, at some point people have to make erroneous statements, stupid statements, so they can be contradicted, so they can be educated, so that, there, that conversations and dialogues and debates and even arguments can happen. Without that, you're essentially not so much on, on the road to less freedom, you're on the road to mediocrity. And that's, I think, something that universities really need to fear. So are you saying that people need to practice the art of forgiveness? I think people need to practice the art of, well, forgiveness always, right, or most of the time, uh, forbearance, curiosity, uh, compassion, candor. Uh, there are a whole series of, of habits of mind that go with a culture of free speech uh, that encourage conversation and engagement. And I think it's interesting to note that as the American culture, I'm speaking maybe in over generalizations, but let, let, me, let me say this. As American culture has receded from a kind of default position in favor of free speech, our conversations have actually become more rancorous, not less. We have forgotten, in fact, how to speak across differences. People are never sure whether they're going to put the foot wrong, and if they do put the foot wrong, at least as others see it, others feel they're entitled not to um, engage them, but to pour scorn on them. And that's that, so that's, I think, what has become problematic with our culture, as we've gotten we've moved away from a kind of a, a default mentality that free speech is good. Our speech itself has suffered. Our ability to engage people on other sides of a debate and argument has diminished. 
So can, do you think there are, are there <clears throat> boundaries to free speech, especially in the age of social media and um, online extremism? Are there boundaries to free speech? Look, Twitter is a private platform. It can do what it wants, unfortunately. Um, uh, the, the boundaries, again, I guess I would... Just I, to add on that, too, do you think that there's a line between freedom of expression and hate speech? I don't believe in the concept of hate speech. I think there is hateful speech. I think there is bad speech. I think there is uh, speech that um, is grotesque and vile. But hate speech is a legal term of art. In Canada, in Germany, in other legal jurisdictions, there's a defined idea of what hate speech is. I don't actually think that in societies that try to limit speech by um, uh, defining hate speech as a separate category, I don't think they've improved the quality of speech. I don't think they've improved the quality of the culture because one thing that I think has made speech worse is when people who do have ideas that you and I, and I'm sure everyone in this audience would consider hateful, feel like they are martyrs to a censorious deep state or t big tech that is trying to suppress their, their, their speech. And they end up gaining from that. And you can see that, by the way, not only in the United States, but in, in, in France, which with the best of intentions has tried to suppress um, uh, neo-Nazi expressions or denial of the Holocaust, what they've done is they've made it fashionable among comedians and others to, to engage this just because it's a way of fighting the system as much as it is insulting Jews or other minorities. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about uh, comparing us to Europe and also about um, extremism. I want to talk about your opinions on the Second Amendment because I know that you feel pretty strongly and we also in this community just experienced a horrific mass shooting um, at the Covenant School about 10 minutes from where we're sitting right now. Um, can you enlighten us a little bit about your views on the Second Amendment and why you have called in the past for um, basically repealing the Second Amendment. Yeah, this, this tends to surprise people who sort of assume, oh, Brett Stevens, right-wing columnist at the Times. Um, but uh, look, the Second Amendment was written in a era when a skilled marksman could get off maybe two shots in 90 seconds. Maybe there's an expert here who will correct me, but that's roughly right. Uh, you can now get off 90 shots in a minute with, um, you know, uh, 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 what's it called, a bump stock, uh, even with a semi-automatic weapon. So we have an amendment that was conceived in one technological era that could never, who, who's, who's, where, where the founders, I think, could never have imagined the kind of carnage that uh, weapons uh, could, uh, could exact on, on ordinary uh, civilians. And I think it's, it's crazy. Now, I have issues with gun laws because gun laws that apply in one jurisdiction uh, but not across a border tend to be just totally ineffective. And I think there's a certain amount of, of virtue signaling. On the other hand, in New York, when Mayor Bloomberg uh, was, uh, was in office, there was a very hard crackdown on illegal weapons and, in fact, murder rates in New York City plummeted, communities across the city uh, profited from it. But the reason I've advocated the abolition or the repeal of the Second Amendment is that I don't think that we can really change the culture in this country until the constitutionality of the right is, is, uh, is, is repealed. Um, otherwise, I think we're going to be... It, how likely is that? So how likely was... Um, uh, marriage equality in 1992 or five, three, when people first started talking about marriage equality. Any of you with long memories in, in this room will remember that the idea of gay marriage uh, seemed absurd, like, like a ridiculous proposition. And it was about, I think, 25 years between Andrew Sullivan writing that seminal article in The New Republic and uh, the Oberfeld decision uh, in, in, in the Supreme Court. 
So my, look, you know, my role as a columnist isn't to make policy happen. It's to at least plant an idea in people's mind that if you want to be serious about a gun culture, which is completely out of control in the United States, then you have to think more radically than passing restrictive ordinances in one town that don't apply in the neighboring one. Right. So speaking of which, in terms of what your job is as an opinion columnist and as a journalist, um, and being such an advocate for free speech, and as you've articulated about, um, um, about the role of free speech, especially at academic institutions, can you give us an example of when you've changed your mind um, after listening to someone else who you initially disagreed with? Oh, many times. I mean, uh, this probably happens more often uh, than uh, than I publicly admit. <laughs> but look, I mean, there's a, there's a kind of funny challenge somewhere of being a columnist, which is on the one hand, you have to present yourself as someone a kind of a know-it-all. I mean, you just have strong opinions. That's the job. Uh, you know, my, my colleagues on the new side are hired not to have an opinion. And I'm hired. You would fit in well at an academic institution. I'm hired to have an opinion, and so you have to constantly have a stream of opinions. And and I'm sort of a congenitally opinionated person. Uh, when I came to the Times, my first uh, column in the Times it was a huge controversy because I was um, skeptical not of climate change as an idea, but of what I thought was climate alarmism. What year was this? 2017. Okay. And it wasn't that I, I denied that the climate was warming or that greenhouse gases had something to do with it. I was just pretty relaxed on the subject of, of climate change. And I thought there was a kind of a degree of hysteria in the culture about, about climate. And I wrote this column and 40,000 people signed a, a petition demanding that I be fired, um, which, which weirdly I found flattering. Uh, 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 tells you probably more about me than you care to know. Um, one of the people who signed one of those petitions was an oceanographer, a guy named John uh, Englander. And after he had sort of put his name to it, he started reading me and he thought, you know, he's not so awful after all. And so he cold called me when he was in New York one day and he said, look, I, I kind of like your column. I think you're wrong on climate. I, I bring people to Greenland to actually see climate change won't you come? And I thought, okay, free junket to Greenland, which I always, you know, I'm a journalist, obviously I'm for free junkets. Um, uh, and I've always wanted to go to Greenland. And the biggest thing that could happen is I might change my mind. So this was 2019. I was going to go the summer of 2020. It was postponed a couple of summers. I wound up going in the summer of 22. And that caused a really profound rethink. And it wasn't so much a rethink about climate, it was a rethink about the nature of risk. Um, we just had a pandemic where what seemed to be a almost a fantasy threat of some global virus that you'd read sort of Michael Crichton novels about before suddenly becomes the reality of, of everyone's life overnight. And that caused me to ask hard questions about whether I was considering risk medi mitigation in, in the right way. Let's say that I was, uh, what I asked myself is, let's say that I was 75% right about climate, but perhaps there was 25% that could be wrong and badly wrong in a way that would have catastrophic and irreversible consequences. Well, if I apply that logic to say the chance of a fire in my house, I would take out some fi serious fire insurance. So why shouldn't I apply the same logic to climate? So that caused a, a 7,000 word piece in the Times. And it felt good for my soul. It felt good to sort of do a deep rethink, to say so publicly. The only sour note is that when it, we live in a culture when I did that, and it's kind of like burying yourself and saying, I'm wrong. and. In a world, in the world in which we live, the response to that is not good for you, good for changing your mind, good for having that capacity. It's, you idiot, why did it take you this long? So that was the main response. Well, that was part of the response. Okay. And I mean, I don't mind because I thought it was it was an important thing to do. But there's there's something wrong when 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 someone publicly admits being yeah. wrong, we should do more to say, good for you for for d putting in the work. So on that, about what shapes your opinion, um, 
and what informs and shapes your opinion as which is what's which, which is in motion i want to ask you um what in essence do you think shapes you and motivates you what makes brett stevens brett stevens and um on that line of thinking is there a challenge or is that or a moment that you can think back to um either in your childhood time, you told me, which is a very colorful, um, and I hope you'll share it a little bit since you're writing a book about it, um, but, um, or t- time as a student that really made you who you are today. You know, I, I don't know why, but I'm a born contrarian. And like, even as a child, uh, it's congenital. It, just as a child, if, if someone said X, I was tempted what, to say Birth what? order? Uh, it's a slightly complicated. I'm the only child from my parents' marriage. They each had... Because we were just talking about birth order older, in the back in the green room. Older children. So I, I don't know whether this gives me some princeling uh, mentality. Um, but uh, so A, being a born contrarian, growing up in Mexico City uh, and sort of feeling like I always had an insider-outsider perspective, being Jewish also insider-outsider feeling particularly in Mexico. When I was in high school, I started a rabble-rousing alternative student paper. And the mainstream student paper was edited by a guy named Joe Kahn, who's now the editor-in-chief of the New York Times. He was a couple years older than I am. But it's sort of funny that these roles remain you know, consistent <laughs> uh, uh, over time. Um, and uh, look. I'm not, I, I honestly don't know how to answer the, the question. I was just someone with a real interest in, in the world, a passion for writing, and a belief that if conventional wisdom was why, I'd better think about X. Well, the reason I'm asking, too, is because, you know, it takes a lot to write what you're writing. These are very important, weighty issues, and you have strong opinions about them, and it seems as if it comes from a from a deep-rooted place. And so that's why in reading your work, I was wondering, it's like, what who, what makes Brett Stevens Brett Stevens? How does he come at this and the angle and the perspective that he's coming at it? Because we all are products of our experiences. And so that was just on my mind, and I, I wanted to ask it. And also the, ne- leads to the next question, which is, as a self, um, as someone who identifies as a conservative commentator, which I assume that you do, um, what do you see as the most important principles or values guiding your political beliefs? Let me just, as you yeah, were sure. asking, I, I thought of another point that, that's yeah. worth mentioning. Um, you know, my mother was born into hiding in Nazi-occupied Europe as a Jewish child. And um, I take seriously the privilege of being able to think out loud and be myself out loud. Uh, And some knowledge of where she came from, the circumstances into which she was born, the fact that her grandmother was first a refugee from the Bolsheviks, then from the Nazis, that my mother came to this country as a 10-year-old displaced person, that sense that we have these liberties in the United States, use them. I think that plays a role in the way I, I think about the world. It's, it's another, another side. Um, what, am I con- sharing that. what am I a conservative? So I, I've always felt like being a conservative in the United States is very different from being a conservative in, say, Europe. Right. In that the European tradition of conservatism is this is where you're from, this is your culture, protect it, honor it, worship it. Okay. The... My idea of being a conservative in the United States, which is no longer shared by uh, people I used to break bread with ideologically until 2016, um, uh, is that the American conservative tradition is trying to preserve a fundamentally liberal order. That what we got in 1776 and then refined and improved through uh, amendments is a is what you know a political philosopher would call a liberal regime founded on the dignity and rights of the individual uh, person and his or her equality, and that what conservatives offer this conversation is a way to create institutions that protect that concept. So a conservative thinks that, for instance, 
stable families are important because they create uh, moral, responsible, uh, emotionally secure, tend to create uh, 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 citizens. Conservatives think that patriotism is important because we should revere the thinking of founders who, flawed as they were as human beings, nonetheless brought this order you know, uh, into, into being. Conservatives think that things like business, enterprise, the freedoms that come with it create habits of mind and character that support l liberal institutions which don't support themselves. And that conservatives finally also think that a healthy republic is one in which conservatives live in a kind of productive tension with liberals and progressives. I mean, one point I've always made to my liberal friends is, look, face it, there's gonna be a conservative movement in the United States, and the question isn't whether to have it or not. You don't have that option. Your option is, do you want a healthy conservative movement or an unhealthy one? Is it already here? We now have a very unhealthy conservative movement. And what happened in 2016, from your perspective? Uh, what happened in 2016, from my perspective? <laughs> Something happened. You alluded to yeah. it. I'm just, if you can refresh my memory. <laughs> uh, something happened then. Um, a, uh, a bigoted blowhard uh, um, lucked into winning an election and transformed the Republican Party beyond anything that I recognized it to be, in short. Where do you think it goes from here? I think it gets worse. Is that uh, worse until it gets better, or? I mean, you know, my grandmother was, you asked about my grandmother, she was a friend of Trotsky's, and, uh, you know, his view was, for things to get better, they must get worse. Uh, uh, I hope that what worse means is that electoral defeat lean, leads kind of normie conservatives to say, uh, we are- Did you say normie conservatives? Like normal. Yeah, I know, uh, but it's fun. Know, <laughs> is it, am I not supposed to say normie? No, I think it's a fun word. I think it's a fun phrase. I, I, is it like a like a Gen Zer word? No, or it's the like, first time hearing the normie uh, conservative. I like it. All right. Well, feel free to steal it. Uh, <laughs> um, look, what I what I hope what I had hoped in 2020, and then with the uh, midterm elections in 22, was that conservatives would say, "Oh my gosh, what have we done? We are being led by." an idiot and a vote loser, and we've got to get back to something like what we had been pre-2016. Uh, pre but it, to be honest, the Republican Party, as I see it, and this is not true of everyone, and I don't want to sort of make sure. wildly blanket statements, but the Republican Party increasingly kind of resembles a cult. Okay, um, I've heard and, that from other and people. And in, when in a cult, the leader is always right. The leader is always being persecuted by enemies, who are shadowy and dangerous, but only he can defeat. He is both the ultimate victim and the ultimate hero. Uh, you know, you can sort of look at a variety of cults in history and they resemble some of these patterns. Sometimes they end with people drinking poison Kool-Aid, uh, and, you know, and I hope that's not how it ends here. But there is there is something to the Republican Party and its fixation with Trump, which has that feature. And since I am asking the questions, I want to also give you a chance to comment on any observations or thoughts you have about the Democratic Party right now. Well, I think the Democratic Party is a kind of a giant missed opportunity uh, at the moment. May, and I say this, look, I got to be like completely honest. I mean, in a way, it's a missed opportunity because it's not doing what I want it to do, you right. know. Um, and, uh, and so, I, you know, I, I'm aware of, of, of this. But I think the conservative party, uh, excuse me, the Democratic Party, maybe now it's finding its bearings, but in many respects, particularly on cultural issues, veered a little too far left um, and did needless harm to its brand. I think that minus the glaring character defects, the Democratic Party that represented, that Bill Clinton represented, was the kind of sweet spot for, for Democrats. It was uh, not uh, um, on board with say, certain aspects of progressive culture, it constantly looked to the middle, middle America, you know, uh, 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 had a kind of a common sense approach to both foreign and domestic issues. By the way, Obama had some of this 
as well, even though I think he was a little to the left of Clinton, take something like border security. I mean, I'm as pro-immigrant as they come. I am a deep believer that immigrants radically improve uh, societies. Uh, I mean, even even Southern universities can be radically improved by, you know, chancellors from out of town. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but not having a real border policy strikes me as as lunatic. Not only lunatic because, I mean, societies have to regulate their, their, their borders for a variety of reasons, but because the backlash that it inevitably creates at a populist level is, is, is coming. I mean, that's happening. And why did it take 100,000 migrants in New York City for the Biden administration to say, Oh, I guess I guess we have a problem here, and it's not going to be solved by a long-term development program in uh, Central America. It has to be solved by actual border uh, measures. So I think the Democratic Party has has needlessly harmed itself, and it could have helped itself without doing damage to its basic brand, which is that Democrats believe in freedom and fairness. That to me seems like the essence of what a successful democratic strategies like. So as you feel a little bit right now, and I think a lot of people are feeling this way, that you don't have a home in, in the two-party system. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, look, I used to vote sort of through slightly gritted teeth for Republican candidates because I was never all that socially conservative. Um, I was like a New York, cons New York City conservative. Um, but some of the issues that didn't worry me then, worry me a great deal now. I mean, I, I'm a lifelong supporter of choice. Like I respect the pro-life position, but I've always been a believer in choice. I gotta be honest, I did not think until two years ago that the court was gonna rule as it did mm -hmm. in Dobbs. And so the issue of choice has become much more uh, important for me. So in the last several elections, I have voted for Democrats to my amazement. I go there and I vote and I'm like, what mushroom am I on? <laughs> well, we won't ask you about that. So, um, <laughs> so I do want to. I really want to wade into a, a very difficult topic, and that's on. Um, but you've written on it, and that's on sexual assault and rape. Um, in 2018, the National Crime um, Victimization Survey estimated that 75.1 percent of sexual assaults went unreported. And you've written at one point that you believe one imaginary enemy of the liberal mind is the campus rape epidemic. Is my character characterization or understanding of your views correct? And if so, can you tell us if you think these figures by the National Crime Victimization Survey are misleading? And if so, why? So you're asking me, I did not write that in 2018. I'm pretty sure I wrote it long yeah, before that. Yeah, you wrote it before. No, this came out in 2000. I'm just commenting on this statistic from 2018. Yeah. I, so you're at, just... I'm saying, do you still have that... Do you still have that viewpoint? Has that changed? Has that evolved with time? And do you think that that um, number is accurate or? So you're asking me about a column I wrote easily 10 years ago. Yes. And so you're asking me, you're kind of jogging my memory and. I'm asking, I, do you I, still I, think that, let me put it this way. Do you still think. Um, I, I think if I remember correctly that what was being reported at the time of as the incidence of of campus rape was significantly exaggerated. And the reason I thought that is that if, I th and now I'm just trying to remember the numbers, so don't hold me to this, that if one in five women were coming to college campuses like Vanderbilt and being raped, they wouldn't come to college campuses, just as you wouldn't go anywhere if there was a one in five chance mm. of a heinous crime being committed against you. So what I was objecting to was the characterization, uh, I, as I remember it, uh, of um, an epidemic where the question of what is rape, what is uh, harassment, what is unwanted sexual advance was being, as I remember it, blurred. Now, one thing did happen, and this goes to the conversation we were having earlier. So in 2011 or something, um, uh, the 
Obama Education Department sent a letter to college campuses called a Dear Colleague uh, letter that um, turned campuses into kind of very, working very aggressively against all allegations of mm -hmm. assault, rape, uh, harassment, and so on. And what followed from that was a sudden huge uptick in the number of reported cases. And then what followed after that was a huge uptick in the number of cases where what seemed like like bad sex or you know something short of rape, something unpleasant but not what we would call rape, were resulting in kind of kangaroo courts situations in which young men were being accused, were not being allowed to confront their accuser, were being run off of campuses, and this happened a lot. So the Trump administration comes into office and Betsy DeVos, the then education secretary, <clears throat> pulls back on that. And I wrote a column saying that she had done exactly the right thing because the word rape had been blurred in a way that was injurious to due process and that was actually in some ways diminishing the horror of rape by conflating situations that are uncomfortable or difficult or ambiguous with situations that are horrific and uh, inexcusable. I wrote this column and I thought I felt great about it and a young woman who used to be, at one point had been an intern of mine, told me, you know, I respect your column and you're probably right, but I had a situation as a young woman where I got fall down, I, I was basically fall down drunk at a party and I woke up uh, with no memory next to a boy I didn't recognize and screamed. And it was a very powerful moment in which I said, well, maybe I am wrong here. Her letter was so moving that I said, I'll tell you what, I will hand over my column to you. Next week's column, I'm gonna put a brief preface. I wrote this column last week. A person I know who, whose name I won't give wrote a response. I, want, I don't wanna speak for her. I want her to speak for herself. So I go back 10 years, was I objecting to what I thought was an, uh, a, a word epidemic, which I thought was exaggerated? Yeah, and, and I'd, I'd have to revisit that. But I feel like at that moment, I did honor to someone whose victimization in my mind was unquestionable and let her tell her story. And that's how I've tried to handle it. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and um, what are your views on another hot button topic issue? Um, and um, that's the latest case on affirmative action. So I know you've been vocal about this. Uh, Growing up, I was just kind of by default in favor of affirmative action. Um, I, I, I thought that the argument about equity, about uh, people not coming to the starting line in the same place, was a very powerful argument. That's going back to the 1980s when, you know, the 60s were not such a distant memory. Uh, I've come to feel that affirmative action may have been right 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I have deep doubts about it now. And I was, I thought the court, even though the court's decision left open all kinds of ambiguities that are gonna be litigated for a long time, I thought the court got it right for a few reasons. Um, I find it very difficult to make the case that a child from an upper class, second or third generation college educated black family should have an advantage in ad the admissions process over a first generation, lower class white student. Because the argument for affirmative action is ultimately an argument for um, upward mobility for people from lower class backgrounds. And that should not apply according to, to race. By the way, for the same reason I don't believe in legacy admissions, uh, because that just also perpetuates privilege. Second thing is, a statistic that hit me very hard. So the average graduation rate, according to some academic data from last year, the average graduation rate across the board in four-year colleges of graduating after six years is 
But for African-American students, it's 43%. So if you're an African-American student in college, you have a less than 50% chance of, of graduating in six years. So I am not convinced that you are well served. I mean, a university is serving itself by saying our freshman class has, let's say, 15% uh, black or African-American students. But if these students are then going through the colleges and not graduating, they're not getting a diploma, they're getting a mountain of debt, right, and, and lost opportunities. Is that the case across the board right now for not only African-American students but other students too? So what I've seen, according to the data, is Asian-American students have the highest graduation uh, rates, and it's north of 70, six-year graduation rates. Then white students, I think it's in the 60s, and Hispanics, I think 56. But I'm just asking, are you really serving uh, an African-American student with an admissions offer, which is great, if they're not graduating after four, five, six years, and they're taking on debt? And I guess my last point is a kind of a psychological one. When I got to the Times, at this point, I, I had a Pulitzer Prize. I had like done, you know, I'd been elected to the Pulitzer Board. I'd done all this stuff. And I get to the Times, and uh, on social media, lots of progressive critics just didn't like my views, said, oh, he's the affirmative action hire at the Times. Now. When they use affirmative action in connection to me, they know exactly what that means. Like, you're some mediocre dumbass who got in because the Times felt it needed a conservative columnist after Trump uh, won the presidency. Never mind that I was a never-Trumper. So to these, at least these critics on social media, affirmative action, when it applied to me, meant undeserving mediocrity, getting into elite institution, uh, um, unfairly, but when they apply the same term at, say, you know, uh, an, an elite institution, they're adamantly in in favor of it. And I think that there is a psychology behind the support for affirmative action, which is patronizing, diminishing, and 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 really in in subtle ways profoundly damaging. Now, whether that is a decisive argument against it, I don't know. Stephen Carter wrote a great book called Reflections of an affirmative action baby. But that tilts, that leads me to incline that universities should be acting aggressively to recruit from communities that aren't putting kids in college, but that should be on a basis of class, not race. And so where are you coming from on your stance on Black Lives Matter? Well, I think Black Lives Matter, there, there are two issues at work here. One is the words Black Lives Matter, and one is an organization riddled with corruption and self-dealing and ideological extremism. So I think a lot of people glom onto the words Black Lives Matter because they feel a, a sense of identification that at a moment of uh, where, where there's, you know, especially after George Floyd's murder, a palpable sense that uh, black America is being systemically mistreated. They want to attach themselves to the words Black Lives Matter. But Black Lives Matter is actually an organization that pulls in a lot of money and doesn't appear to spend it on improving black lives. So I, at one point, I think you might be drawing from the same interview. I, I yes. called it like a, a kind of a thuggish organization. Listen, when I saw a BLM uh, slogan from Chicago with the paragliders who uh, last week or 10 days ago murdered uh, 260 Israeli uh, um, uh, ravers, uh, innocent people just at a dance party, and they were getting behind us. I thought, what exactly is this, is this organization doing other than being basically a, a, a far-left extremist organization that is not representing black lives, is representing a kind of an ideological agenda? So it's, it's worth examining, or as you say in universities, interrogating what this organization is actually doing and what it's actually doing for the benefit of, of, of black lives, or in this case, of, of, of any life. Um, 
just because of time, I'm going to move to another um, uh, area, and that's the Chancellor mentioned about we live in an era of curated news, and you've also written a lot about the role of media and journalism um, in these times. And so my question is, what role do you believe the media plays in shaping public opinion and political discourse? And specifically, you've called for return to more objective journalism. Do you view us as is that a possibility? Do you think that's a possibility? And do you also think that we're currently suffering from an era of disinformation that presents an enormous challenge that we haven't yet figured out how to overcome? Uh, look, we're suffering in general from uh, not just a, uh, a problem in the media, but a, a, a broad social problem, which is the collapse of authority and the concept of authority in, in the United States. Um, which stems from healthy impulses of questioning authority, but has become a real problem in, in massive trust deficits across institutions. We're not helped by living in a country where no one trusts anything. The media has not helped, and I'm now talking about like my end of the media, the okay, you know, the the, the Fleet Street, the the higher price side of media, has not helped itself by um, reporting that too often veers almost nakedly into social advocacy. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a piece about objectivity earlier this year because a former editor-in-chief of the Washington Post, a guy I think should know better, saying, was saying we should just get rid of objectivity as, as a standard. It's bad enough that so few people trust us, this would lead to the eradication of trust. I'll, I'll tell you just, there's a great little scene in Dr. Strangelove, as people I assume have seen Dr. Strangelove, wonderful movie. And so you know the premise, uh, some crazy American general has ordered bombers to, to bomb Russia. Turns out the Russians have this doomsday machine that uh, will destroy the world with ra radioactivity if they're ever attacked, but they hadn't actually announced the doomsday machine. And, you know, so anyway, okay. this is the premise. And there's this, this the, the scene that I'm referring to is the Russian ambassador is called into the war room to help mediate between the president, his advisors, and the Russian uh, uh, chairman, you know, the Khrushchev figure. And um, uh, he, the, the ambassador makes some claim and the American general, I think played by uh, George C. Scott, uh, was, uh, not Sterling Hayden, George C. Scott, says, well, that's a damn commie lie. And the Russian general looks at him and says, my source was the New York Times. <laughs> and what's wonderful about the scene is it shuts down the conversation. Like, well, it must be true, right? Now, I love the Times, and I think it's an incredible institution, but if you said that today, it'd be like, only said ironically, right? And that's a, that's a real problem we have. So how do we move back to a standard where people felt that if it was published in the Times or the Journal or the Washington Post, it's almost certainly true? Right Is now, that possible? half the country might, but the other half doesn't. Look, I don't know what you can do to fix distrust other than to be more trustworthy. And in too many instances, I think, the elite media has not made itself trustworthy, has not offered a fair balance of views on its editorial pages, and has tilted the field in, in a lot of its reporting in ways that don't go unnoticed. So how do you think we should, do, what are some just thoughts? It doesn't have to be right, but just what are some thoughts that are coming to your mind? Because we're all trying to explore what we do right now in this moment. Well, w one of the great things that the Times did is basically told our reporters to get off Twitter. Okay. Uh, so that you couldn't discern a reporter's views by just going to his Twitter feed and seeing who he was retweeting or she was retweeting, what they liked, what they disliked, and you know you quickly could could suss out where where their 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 politics are. Okay. Secondly, a way more muscular attempt, energetic attempt, to really understand the views of the people that the Times doesn't really know, and that also means hiring from places where the Times and other major media don't hire. Look, I, I, I haven't done a count, but the number of Yale graduates at the Times is high, you know? Nothing wrong with that. I've heard it's a good school, or used to be. Um, um, 
but it would not be bad to have a lot of reporters who went to Ohio State. I'm just kind of pulling that out of my hat. There are lots of smart people coming out of Ohio State who might understand something about the country that we're missing when we live in a bubble defined by, um, you know, 40 from 41st Street all the way to, I mean, it's the classic New Yorker uh, um, cover. You know, the, the world out there looks like a constellation of rocks and interesting places until you get to California. Yeah, so what advice do you have for students right now? Um, because that's what we're here for really right this moment or for the students um, who aspire to become journalists and opinion columnists, especially in today's media landscape. If you were a student today and knowing what you know now, what would you advise them? Uh, don't go to journalism school. Good advice. Uh, no, it, it's excellent advice. Uh, uh, um, a, a few things I am truly sure, but this is really... Uh, one of them, one of the why? Gr why the great why? wastes of money in history, uh, because what what being a great journalist demands of you is first of all particular knowledge of a specific subject, right? So uh, you want to be a um, uh, you want to report about Latin America. Make sure you speak fluent Spanish. Make sure you take classes in 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 that area. You travel there. You think about it. You want you care about the craft of writing. Write, follow, find writers you admire and imitate them. Mm. But you become a good writer by imitating a good writer and then failing to imitate them well and then developing your own style. That's what, that's, as I, as I my experience was, that's how good writers are. are. Who did you start with imitating? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, probably Charles Krauthammer as a columnist, uh, in part because I agreed with him, but there was a very kind of, a great, sort of clean and energetic pro style. He didn't let, he didn't waste words. And I really studied him. I studied kind of the, I'd ask myself, why does he write a paragraph like that? You know, why does he punctuate like that? What, what is he doing at every, at every, uh, at every stage? Um, don't be afraid of having opinions. Um, and I think I notice a lot of young people are kind of uh, very guarded about having opinions because, if, God forbid, they'll say the, the wrong thing, at least if you want to go into uh, opinion journalism. If you don't want to go into opinion journalism, then keep your damn opinions to yourself and kind of look, uh, look, look, at, you know, look at the world with a fresh eye. One point I will make, because you asked me about the, the column I wrote years ago, and I'd have to go back and look at it. Yeah, a while ago. Um, so I've written north of a thousand columns and maybe 900,000 words in those columns. Um, wow. Almost certainly I have said stupid things within the ambit of 900,000 words. And I'm, I'm conscious of, of this. I'm also conscious that as a columnist, I am trying to reflect in some provoking, intelligent, and productive way on what's happening at the moment. And, you know, reading a column 10 years after it was written is like finding a slice of pizza uh, that was sitting in your fridge in the back like 10 days after the pizza was bought. Very few people eat it and nobody should be expected to eat it. Well, I mean, one of the re I mean, there's a couple <laughs> there's a couple reasons I asked you the question. And one is because I don't know I don't know what you think right now. And I realized that and I wanted to give you also the opportunity that shows someone who's on a not to be cheesy, but who's on a journey. And I think that that's, that's what's fair and is to say, where are you on this, on this topic right now? And that's not, to, that's not to try to get you. It's to try to understand. Your, your, you, know, you influence a lot of people through your writing. How many people read your columns, would you say now? Or how many, people, how many readers do you have? As they say in Israel, it's depend. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I don't. I mean, anywhere between a half a million to more, many more than that. Yeah. So, kind of peeling back the curtain a little bit yeah. into your, um, if you want to call it a craft, is helpful, and is it's also a lesson for people to say and to hear that if you're willing to move, and and you and it, you know, you're t you have a very philosophical and important. Um, 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 
doctrine that you follow around free speech. And I think it's important for us that, to, to understand that right now and to see that one of the reasons, what I'm hearing from you say is one of the reasons you also believe in it is be for, for personal reasons. You don't want, you know what happens if your speech is censored, um, but also because it helps inform you and what, how you're viewing, how you're experiencing, what you're thinking. No, that's absolutely right. And I'm, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go find that, that column again. I'll send it to and, you. <laughs> and no, I mean, I, I, I can now sort of, I wrote a column, that was a column about, in which I also mocked the idea of massive hunger in the United States, if I remember that. And my point was not to mock hunger and not to diminish the heinousness of sexual assault. My point was to, as I remember it, ask questions about the way in which statistics get used which for partisan purposes which may not be reliable but that I might go back and go oh crap how could I have written that and I'll let you know do you ever press send and you're nervous you send in your column no okay so just one thing about that uh, I send in a column it goes first to my fact checker, and my instructions to my fact checker is be as um, be as uh, uh, aggressive as you can, because I'd rather get things wrong with you before we publish than than with with anyone else. And so I've I've I have as every columnist at the Times does a very good fact checker, and then an editor who asks good questions. I don't get heavily edited. I'm a pretty clean writer. But there's always a sense when I hit, when they hit publish, when you're like, did I get everything right? You know? Yeah. Um, so one of the tricks I, I do is I will read the column out loud. Um, I've heard other people Which is helpful. And then I have a, a, a friend I will often send the column to for like a, you know, catch me if I'm saying something extra stupid here um, and and she often does and I want to end with a, a question that's very near and dear to our hearts and then open it up to Q&A here um, and the Chancellor also talked about it and that is the um, traumatic war in the Holy Land that I know that we both have personal and professional connections to and I know that we're all grieving and mourning the loss of uh, Israeli and Palestinian um, and American and Jewish civilian lives. And we talked a little bit about that before we came up on stage together live and talking about how we're both depressed about it. And um, my question is just, and you said this is different. This one's different. And you were the editor of the Jerusalem Post from 2002 to 2007 or around that time Okay, but around a very hot time there too. Um, and you said this feels different. How does it feel different? And what are you thinking right now about this? And do you, um, do you have hope? And for people who are calling for peace, do you think that that's possible? Or do you think that it's, I'm going to put in a couple of questions here, or naive. And what do you think that this means not only for Israelis and Palestinians, but for the world, including the United States? Such a tiny question. Uh, look, uh, in the spirit of candid conversation, uh, I can't help but look at this, look at what happened on October 7th through a very personal lens. Yeah as a Jew and as the son of a hidden child in the Holocaust and as someone who always looked to Israel as a country that for all of its many flaws protected and existed to protect Jewish life. Um, because Israel is such a small country, about nine million people, uh, I think Americans might not realize that when 1,200 or 1,300 people are dead, massacred, that's proportionally the equivalent of about 45, 48,000 Americans. In other words, people saying it's Israel's 9-11, it's actually 15 or 16 9-11s. And I've had a very hard time, um, I'm speaking not as an analyst here, not as Brett Stevens, a columnist, just a human being. I've had a very hard time uh, 
digesting it in any way emotionally in that uh, my, my, my fury and my anguish and my despair are all roiling inside of me. It's, it's nothing that I have, I mean, I, my office was right across the street from 9-11, uh, on, on 9-11. I was actually in the Middle East when 9-11 happened, but uh, uh, at, at the time then, it was somehow more comprehensible, more emotionally manageable. Um, uh, I can't, and, and being a columnist, unfortunately requires you to opine. And there's a side of me that desperately wishes that I didn't have to opine. Because, you know, I'm expected, I know the region, I'm going out there on Sunday, I'm expected to offer analysis and my thoughts, and I do. Um, but preceding that is a purely human element of this, this despair and anguish and rage that I feel. And I feel that before anything else, that's the dimension that we need uh, to grasp. I think the chances of peace have been put so far out of hand. I mean, not that they were anywhere near in hand before. So far out of hand. I see this war easily escalating, not just in to, to Lebanon, but involving the United States, involving Iran. I think people tend to forget that World War II didn't actually start. World War II was a bunch of global, was a bunch of regional conflicts that became one, uh, not in 1939, but really in 1941. And what we're now looking at is a terrible regional conflict in Central Europe that's taken tens of thousands of lives, a conflict in the Middle East that has taken thousands and may take ten th tens of thousands of lives, and the potential for one in the Far East, uh, as I fear China sees an opportunity uh, to seize Taiwan. I don't think that's, that's, that's something we should be thinking about. And, and so I, I just feel a sense of just despair and horror that not only to live through this time, having come of age after 1989, but that my kids are entering this world as well. Um, uh, I mean, maybe you want more analysis. That's what I write my column for, but I just feel as a human being, just the mass of suffering um, brought about by the wantonness of, of hate, and, and it's overwhelming. Well, thank you for sharing, and um, I'm sorry to end on that note of our conversation, but um, it was very important, so thank you. And I would like to now open it up to questions. Yes. Um, I don't remember the poetry in my last piece, uh, but maybe you're right. Uh, I don't actually remember my last piece. Uh, um, look, when I ar argue for objectivity in journalism, it's an argument about what happens on what we in the Times or other newspapers call the news side. I believe that m I am hired at the Times to have opinions as my you know, colleagues, Michelle Goldberg or Tom Friedman or Maureen Dowd, we're just opinionated people and there's a market for this and we like to have opinions about news and people groove on this stuff. I don't think we're the main or most important aspect of the news business. The main and most important aspect of the news business happens on the other side of the proverbial Chinese wall with our reporters and editors there. And that's where I'm making the argument for uh, objectivity. Um, that that it's their responsibility to would to be as analytical as possible, and you know I understand the argument against it is like well everyone brings an opinion bias experience to any given story, but we can in fact do our best, or reporters can in fact do their best to disguise those things to be that much more analytical. That's what makes a great reporter, someone who can look at facts and uh, 
offer them uh, or describe them in a compelling and uh, and accurate and comprehensive and fair way and remove them their own views from that equation. It's a hard thing to do. And that's why we pay mediocre salaries for those people. Yes. Thank you for the question. Um, well, some of the stories are not at all pleasant um, because uh, there's some unpleasant and devoted readers of the Times um, uh, whose file goes to security and often then to the FBI. Um, no, that's a scary aspect of, of, of the job, that you're kind of a public figure, but you're not some gigantic celebrity with security, and, and there's that. Then there are letters that, um, let, me, let me answer this more briefly. I read every letter I get. And do I look at the comments section on my column? Sadly, I do. Because uh, I'm you know, morbidly curious and, 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 and then someone will say, just, just cut that out. And I do try to respond when I feel like there's something engaging about a person and I, I have a kind of an intuition of trust that this person will answer me like in on planet normie to go back to that word um, uh, it, it, it's become a little harder since I went to the times because it's such a gigantic institution you know when I was at the journal I thought well the journal is a big newspaper but the journal to the Times is like the Grateful Dead to the Beatles. Um, like, the journal was like a cult. You, if you were into it, you were into it. Otherwise, you didn't pay any attention. It, with the Beatles, everyone participates. Like, I'm Ringo, but I'm still, you know, in the band. And and people are like, why are you such a loser? But you're at least you're in the band. Uh, um, and I and so you know a column will elicit so many letters that you just don't know uh, what to do, and you have to be kind of brutal with your time. But some of my long-standing friendships uh, have occurred because I answered letters, and I'll just offer one quick example. I get a letter out of the blue from a reader who says, "I like your column." Um, I feel like I don't like your views on uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and I feel like you are really biased against the Arab side. I said, I wrote him back. I said, I think you're unfair. He's an Arab American. Here are a bunch of columns that I've written over the years that I think tell a different view. I'm against Arab regimes and bad Arab leaders, but I don't feel I've been unfair in covering the uh, struggle of Egyptians against oppression and so on. And he wrote me back, he said, you know, I'd never read these. I'd be honored to have lunch with you. I said, please, let's do it. We've been friends now for 15 years. Um, uh, from Detroit, family from, uh, originally from uh, Syria. Um, and those are some of the most meaningful friendships of my life. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So let's combine two, yes. Oh, the yeah. lecture you gave, I think, in Australia. Um, what are your 
I guess, suggestions to educators that are having difficult conversations in their classroom um, to allow for free speech, speech to be uh, heard, while still, uh, as, as we say, um, making sure, and you might take objection to this, but like safe space for everyone. Um, what are your thoughts on that? How can educators kind of lean into that and, and allow their students to engage in authentic free speech? It's, it's a, do you want to take the next one, or should I just answer this? Just answer that. Don't take one more. Okay, yeah. so just briefly, I am a great believer in the virtue of debate, of structured debate, because it allows both sides to be represented. It has certain kinds of basic rules so that it, you are you, you honor the other side's right to speak because you want them to honor yours, so there's a quality of reciprocity. It forces you, especially if you really do debate societies well, it forces you to think through the views of the other side and say, uh, okay, well, I now have to debate the, you know, whatever, the pro-life side. Well, what would be the best argument on, on that side? So I think, and it's exciting, by the way, because it has a quality of a contest. The, the worst thing that happens is when people say, we need conversations and then we need to end with four cliches about you know how we're just happy, better people. Like, it's why that never works. Let's, let's actually not blunt the argument, let's sharpen it. Sharpen it so much that you can really understand uh, what the other person is saying. And what I've, I sometimes, at my best, I try to do in my column, is I will offer the view of my opponent. It's, you know, proleptic argumentation, to use a fancy word. Um, and try to express their view so well that they can't come away saying, well, he just doesn't understand what, 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 I, what I think. The other thing that I think is a wonderful thing is when you ask students to say, okay, what are your views? Now I want you to write a paper taking the opposite view. But just inhabiting, inhabiting someone else's point of view is a fundamentally healthy thing for people to do. And it doesn't mean you have to change your views. I mean, Chancellor Deermeyer said, said it just in his opening remarks. It actually sharpens your own because you understand what you're arguing against. You know, most of the time, I get letters going back to the earlier question or look at comments. And there was a great Austrian physicist who once put down one of his dumber students. He said, you're not even wrong. <laughs> like, you're not even rising to the level of meeting the argument where you could be wrong. And I, I read these letters, I'm like, you're not even wrong. You know, Mr. Stevens, an avid supporter of Trump, and you're like, like this. So, so force your students to experience, at least pedagogically, an opposing view. And I think you're improving their, their education. OK, one last question. Is that a hand up there? Yes. Yeah. OK. Wait, hang on a second. Didn't I just uh, write a column about this? Yeah. I mean, I wrote that in like <laughs> May. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I, I have this, this thing about Pulp Fiction uh, because it's a story about second chances. Behind all the gore and the glam and the artifice and the cleverness, it's a story about people having another shot at their lives. And uh, in, in all of those, or almost all of those little stories, um, uh, people are able to um, turn. And I think that's actually something that's deeply American and something very beautiful about America, that we do have these opportunities to, uh, you know, dust yourself, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and start all over again, as, as, as the song goes. I think it's a beautiful aspect of this. And by the way, it's not just in life, it's also in the life of the mind. You can change your mind. You can, you can rethink. It, it doesn't diminish you as a human being 
it profoundly enriches you as one. And we need to create cultures, institutionally and otherwise, that celebrate those spiritual and intellectual rebirths uh, instead of instead of diminishing and disparaging them. That's a great uh, note to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you.